As dawn broke in Jakarta last Thursday, those close to the president and his family already knew that later that morning, Suharto would resign. Did you have a conversation with him? No, but I have a conversation with the daughter. She said at the time that he will step down uh, the next morning, that is this morning. Just before 9am, the students who'd taken over Indonesia's National Parliament building clustered around the television. They had sworn to continue this occupation until Suharto was gone. They knew that the president would shortly be addressing the nation, but maybe it was just another cabinet reshuffle. The atmosphere was buzzing with rumours and anticipation that this might be the end of the leader they feared and despised. But no one was prepared to believe that Suharto was gone until the words finally fell from his lips. I have decided to declare that I cease being the president of the Republic of Indonesia. <laughs> It was hard to fully comprehend that they'd won. to take off my hat to the students uh, for taking up uh, such a very uh, meaningful role for the country's future. As the news sank in, the euphoria mounted. The dictator was gone, and thanks be to God. For some who had suffered and struggled so long for this moment in Indonesian history, it was all too much. The dramatic end game played out so swiftly. After so much time trying to haggle with him, trying to have a kind of a peaceful surrender by him, then out of sudden he announced that he was willing to relinquish the presidency. How long have you waited for this moment? Oh, many, many years. Abdurrahman Wahid heads up the largest Muslim movement in the country, the 30 million strong Nadla Tululama. The moment when the six students were killed at Trisakta University, was that the moment when President Suharto's days were numbered? Yes, if we look from hindsight, yes. It triggered the whole movement. It doesn't say that there was no movement before that. This is the start of the demonstration at Trisakta University, just nine days before Suharto would stand down. The president and the armed forces still believed that the tried and true practices of brutally suppressing dissent could keep him in power. But someone somewhere high up badly miscalculated how to treat this protest. Let's not always uh, blame the foot soldiers, you know. They may, be, they may have been uh, committing wrong acts, 
But it's the the the. It's the uh, top people in the armed forces it's who it's bear the top people that need to be uh, also be uh, be accountable for this. In the lead up to the Tree Sakti incident, the violence between the armed forces and the students had been escalating around the country. There were beatings, tear gas and rubber bullets. And in recent weeks, activists were disappearing, some reappearing with horrific tales of torture. But until May the 12th at Tree Sakti, no student had been shot dead in Jakarta with live ammunition for making a political protest. It was, however, something they feared. A lot of young people are determined to go on the streets and demand change. I mean, they want to know bottom line questions like, will you shoot them? <laughs> I mean, it's not a black and white situation that you, that you paint. You know, we carry out dialogue. We meet them face to face. We discuss with them. We try to, we try to talk things out. But if they remain unconvinced, if they, if they if defy they, you... How, how, they, we are 200 million people. If they defy you, though... We are 200 million people. Who, who, who are they? We are a people's army. We, we will never go against our people. But if a million people turn out into the streets? If a million people turn out into the street, if, let us, let, let us see. Young men were shot dead with live ammunition, some picked off by snipers as they ran back into the university grounds. Four have been identified as students from the Trisakti campus. We don't have a gun, we only have idealism, uh, we want a better chance in this country, we want a reformation and I don't know what's wrong with that and military shoot, shoot us with uh, their bullet. The standing order is that live bullets are only used when they are ordered by the superior. So the armed forces will just have to look into it. Where did they go wrong? The chief of the armed forces, General Waranto, went on television promising a judicial inquiry into how the killings happened. But the justice system in Indonesia is so discredited that this move failed to calm the mounting outrage at the killings. If you are talking about judiciary, judiciary is the most, not only the most weakest institutions, but the most corrupt institutions. There's what we call here mafia court, yeah? Mafia court. Mafia court, yeah? Or where everything can be bought, yeah? Everything can be arranged. And one former justice at the Supreme Court gave an interview in one of our media saying that over 50 percent of Indonesian judges are corrupt. And you can imagine what kind of judiciary we have under that circumstances. There's no hope for justice unless you have wealth and power. The day after the shooting, Jakarta was on fire. A total of 4,000 shops, supermarkets, restaurants and workshops were burnt down, damaged or looted. 500 banks and over 1,000 houses were torched or vandalised, including that of the richest man in Indonesia, one of Suharto's inner circle of cronies. The value of the battered Indonesian currency plunged to even greater depths. Over 400 bodies were found in the charred remains of burnt out stores. The economic crisis has left over 4 million people unemployed, impoverished and desperate in Jakarta. When the looting started, they poured into buildings like this and couldn't get out in time. Only half of the bodies taken here to this university hospital 
could be identified by the families looking for their relatives. Annie Hasubuan is a doctor at the hospital. They, some of them died because, you know, they, they, they went into the supermarket and want to take everything and the supermarket get burned and they are trapped inside and they cannot go out and they died. But why they want to get to get in into the supermarket and take food and everything because they have nothing. They want it because, you know, some so many people in Indonesia are too poor and they have nothing. So, but Suharto says nothing about that until now. And I feel, I think many people feel that Suharto is responsible for what has happening. President Suharto had been away in Cairo when the tree Sakti students were killed. Three days later, he returned. There was no word of regret for their deaths. He'd issued an ambiguous statement that if he were no longer trusted, that he'd lead the country from behind and promised to enact political reform. But it was very quickly made very clear that this was no offer to resign. Over the weekend, the students were gathering strength and support. Of course we'll keep on fighting. We, we have uh, started uh, a long, long time ago and uh, why, why we have to stop now? Is there a compromise? Can you accept a reform here with, if President Suharto yeah. stays in power? Does he President Suharto is not a part of solution. He's a part of the problem. So, Rama uh, Pratama uh, is one of the leaders one of the student of the movement. To, to He's a political science is, student at the uh, University uh, of Indonesia. To, to... It would be wrong to say the student movement does not have its factions and even its petty jealousies among leadership figures but it's nevertheless remarkable for the unity they've maintained in the crisis. Part of the reason for this is that they've deliberately kept their stated goal simple and agreed. The immediate replacement of President Suharto with a leader committed to a program of political reform. Whoever the various factions may prefer as an alternative president, their leaders are disciplined enough to keep it to themselves. Who do you want to be president of Indonesia? Uh, we don't care with that. Uh, we are not a political party. We have no agenda, uh, political agenda. Uh, uh, our Bergen is a system. Whoever uh, will be the leader, uh, if they, if they uh, do this, uh, this system, we will support them. Rama has organized a meeting with another student faction. Although they don't tell us their agenda at the time, it's to plan the occupation of the national parliament, starting the very next day. <laughs> Monday morning, 10 a.m. Muslim leader Dr. Amin Rais has been invited into the parliament buildings to address a committee of Indonesian parliamentarians concerned with internal affairs. Amin Rice heads up Indonesia's second biggest Muslim organisation, the Muhammadiyah movement, with 27 million members. At the end of last year, he put himself forward as an alternative presidential candidate. As the economic and political crisis has deepened, Rais has emerged as one of Suharto's most outspoken critics. Suharto, he says, pointing disparagingly to the president's portrait, has to stand down. The sooner the better. At least five years ago, I already appealed to this nation to discuss about uh, the succession of uh, the national leadership, meaning that Suharto had to stand down, you know, uh, because I just uh, didn't believe him. Uh, he was a crook as a leader. Uh, he was even a hypocrite, uh, if I may say so. You know, I'm very sorry to, to say something very blunt uh, about uh, my leader. It's strong stuff for the Indonesian parliamentarians, who all owe their jobs to the fact that they've kept on good terms with President Suharto. While they too know that Suharto's days are numbered, most of the questions thrown to Amin Rais 
reject his view that now is the time for change. But even as they debate the issue, right outside the committee room, the students have begun their planned occupation of the parliament ground and buildings. When Rais emerges from the committee room, he's greeted like a hero. Although the military initially positioned themselves as a barrier between the students and the parliament building, there's no attempt to stop the students flooding into the grounds and the corridors of power. <laughs> their teachers, their deans and the university alumni have also turned up to add to the throng. At around five in the afternoon, the pressure notches up yet another level. The Speaker of the House, Mr Hamoko, makes a sudden and stunning statement to the press. The President, he says, should resign. Hamoko is also the chairman of Suharto's own creation, the ruling Golkar party. And I was hugely surprised at uh, Harmoko's courage to, 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 to do that. How isolated is the president now? Very, very isolated. It's quite a dramatic turn. And uh, this happened only within, what, hours. So something more important must have happened. I mean, the balance of power must be shifting without we knowing it. I don't know what it is. Probably it's also their reading of the shift of the balance of power must give them a boost or an impetus to do what they did uh, this afternoon. Dr. Marcelin Siman Juntak is a leading figure in the Indonesian Forum for Democracy. In the mid-1970s, he spent a year and a half in jail for his political views. Dr Simon Juntak knows Suharto's skills too well to be sure that the showdown has really come for the president. I don't want to be too early to say that this is a showdown. Why it's not a showdown yet? Because we have not yet feel or we have not yet seen the strike back of Suharto. We haven't seen yet, considering what he has behind him, we haven't seen yet his response to what, what is done to him uh, these days. Do you expect one, a strike back? Uh, yes, yes. Are you personally fearful because you have been one of the most outspoken leaders of this movement yes. in these very tense times? Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the president may strike at you? Yes, uh, I don't rule out this possibility. Uh, even last week, I got a political rumor, but uh, I think it was almost authentic uh, that there was an instruction from the palace uh, to arrest me. And even there is one major general uh, who was in charge uh, to do that, you know. And then he was hesitating uh, to arrest me. And finally, uh, the instruction was canceled. And I'm, I'm happy for that. How many political prisoners remain now in Indonesian jails? Only God knows, perhaps. I don't know how many political prisoners we have. Certainly, there are political prisoners in Jakarta. Some students were still in jail. Some activists were still in jail. And you still have political prisoners in East Timor, in West Irian, in, in Aceh. And no one can keep track on that. No one can, can keep track on that, yeah? so. This is what has been, uh, what, what should be resolved, yeah, by any leaders, any governments 
come to power. On Monday night, the students at Tri Sakti University are holding a memorial service. It's now six days since the students were killed here at the campus. Although it's a sombre occasion, the students are buoyed by the news of Harmoko's call for the president to resign. At around nine o'clock, there's a candlelit remembrance for the students who died. are unaware that as they grieve, some of their leaders have seen on the news that the chief of the armed forces has denounced the Speaker Harmoko's call for the president to resign as unconstitutional. General Raranto has also warned the students not to go ahead with a rally planned for two days' time. People might get hurt. The student leaders decide that it would be dangerous and irresponsible to tell this crowd what the army has said. Better to let them find out in the morning. We have over a thousand massive here, over a thousand students here. Just because of the shooting, shooting of the army on the 12th May, all the people become very angry, all the students very angry. So if we give this statement, this statement to the student directly right now, in this moment, I do not I do not know what they will do. Maybe, we, are, we are not afraid of their of their madness, they are, maybe they are going mad, I don't know about that. But what we are afraid we do not want any bloody tragedy happened again in this campus. That's for sure. That's why we will not announce this statement right now. We will announce it tomorrow. Will you still go ahead with the march on Wednesday? We will. We will do that. Even if our blood came to the, the last, the last, the last blood, till our last blood, we'll still struggling. We don't afraid of anything. It's the day before the students have planned to march to the National Monument in the center of Jakarta on what's called National Awakening Day. It commemorates the birth of Indonesia's independence movement. At Muhammadiyah headquarters, the Muslim youth are waiting for their leader, Amin Rais, to arrive. Rais has said that one million of his supporters will join the march. Then the news comes through that the president is about to appear on national television. Everyone understands that this will be Suharto's way to try and stop the march from going ahead. The president has gathered some of his more moderate critics to join him at the palace. Among them is the widely respected Muslim leader, Abdurrahman Wahid. <laughs> Wahid's preparedness to deal with Suharto has lost him the support of these more radical Muslim youth. Just as everyone expects to hear what Suharto has to offer, the president takes his guests behind closed doors.
While the people of Indonesia are left to watch daytime television popular culture, Suharto tells the group he's assembled at the palace that he is prepared to enact political reform. One of the group tells him bluntly that what the people mean by political reform is that he should resign. And the president's response? Yeah, he responded by saying that, you know, uh, everything will be seen after the, you know, the, the constitution. It doesn't sound from what you're saying as if he understood the strength of feeling in the country. Yes, he doesn't understand. We know it for sure. Why does the president fail to appreciate that people want him to leave now? Well, I think uh, recently, during the past few years, he has been uh, living in a different reality. He's uh, lost touch. And he's increasingly uh, uh, overconfident of himself. Amin Rais was not invited to the palace meeting, but after it's over, he calls a press conference to respond to the outcome. Suharto has announced that he'll call an early election and he won't stand for president again. But without a definite timetable for when he'll go, this announcement is read as a strategy to buy more time. Yes, I think exactly. I think he is trying to buy time to consolidate his power. Uh, as uh, people say, nobody will relinquish his or her power voluntarily. I think Suharto does not want to relinquish his power voluntarily. I think he is uh, trying his best to consolidate by any engineering possible. Uh, but believe me, he will be defeated very soon. But he is saying that he will go, that he will not stand another term. He is saying he will call an election yes. and he will go. Yes, but there is no time limit at all. What Suharto has announced is not enough to make Rais tell his supporters to stay away from tomorrow's demonstration. What do you hope to achieve by calling your people onto the streets tomorrow? I just want to convince the whole world uh, that Suharto is not trusted any longer by the Indonesian people. But at the same time, I want to make his eyes open uh, and also his heart, if possible, open uh, to receive the very strong message that the people do not believe him any longer. Early the next morning, the streets of central Jakarta are eerily deserted. The only people standing around are soldiers. The roads leading to the National Monument are blocked by barricades and guarded by heavily armed troops and tanks. At 6am, Amin Rais broadcast a message on television telling his supporters to stay at home. He feared another Tiananmen Square. Yesterday evening, uh, somebody told me, uh, who happened to be an army general, that uh, he doesn't care at all if Tiananmen accident, uh, I mean, uh, uh, accident like Tiananmen will take place today in Jakarta. <laughs> The students who are occupying the National Parliament buildings have also abandoned the idea of a march to the monument. They've decided they'll just stay put here until Suharto resigns. I want to I'm so not so, so bad. Kill, but yeah. kill. Ah. Step down. Oh, yes, I yes, understand. Yeah, okay. And will you stay here until he steps oh, down? Oh, yes, of course, of course. You will stay here yes. until yes. the person yes. steps down? Yes, that is my, uh, our idealism. <laughs> Through 
Throughout the morning, thousands more students arrive. There's no attempt to stop them, no attempt to clear them out. Stacks of free food and water have been organised to keep the students well supplied. The day proceeds with one rousing rallying speech after another. The atmosphere is intense. In the mid-afternoon, long-time former Sahato minister Emil Salim arrives to show solidarity with the students. Emil Salim is a widely respected figure, regarded as a Mr Clean in a government riddled with corruption. When I arrived, frankly speaking, I was quite surprised that the reaction of students were so spontaneous. I did not expect that type of acceptance of welcoming me. And so it was a very new experience. I mean, it was for me a uh, fascinating big experience, which I did not expect. The whole experience of meeting the students makes Emile Salim realise that ideas like holding new elections in six months' time are a dangerous joke. The president has to be persuaded to resign immediately. I sense a sense of urgency. It must be done in days and even hours. So after that meeting, I went to see a, a, a top minister and I told him, this must be conveyed to the president that it's not a matter of days anymore, it's a matter of hours. So please, if there is no bloodshed, if we can't prevent them bloodshed, yeah, blood, but then the president must take initiative. And this is our, our notion. Please take the initiative of stepping down voluntary. Otherwise, there will be a big bloodshed. And the strategy was to... Mazuki Darusman is also a former member of parliament. And in the late afternoon, he joined the lobbying effort. The strategy was to try to get in touch with some of the ministers holding economic portfolios, but also <clears throat> what we call conscience portfolios. For example, the justice minister, the uh, religious minister, and the environment minister. Uh, minister so that... If they could be asked and to, to be convinced to, to resign, it could create that, uh, you know, that uh, precipitating factor, and which then could affect a change in, in the overall political balance. And you succeeded in getting 14 ministers to offer their resignation by last night? Well, that was more than we, did, we expected. It was more than we expected, because we started with one or two ministers. And... Uh, for whatever it's worth, if we look back, that might have been the, the crucial factor in effecting that changeover last night. It was a matter of persuading to the president that uh, he had done enough of the service to his country, that perhaps time, it was time to, to uh, exercise a, a graceful exit as a, as a statesman. They submitted a letter together, a joint letter, uh, which was received by the president around about 8 o'clock. And uh, we, were, we understand that uh, he was still trying to convince uh, these ministers to stay on because these ministers were actually a part of the reshuffle package. So right to the very end, he was trying to hang on in there? Uh, yes, it would seem to be the case, yes. On this, the last night before Sahato resigns, there are rumours that the hardliners in the military are trying to provoke an incident in the parliament building as a last-ditch attempt to keep Sahato in power. Because the hardliners were looking for a crackdown? Oh, yes, certainly. They were, they were, they were looking for a chance to, to justify uh, a much severe action, more severe action, in, in trying to clamp down the uh, student movement. There's no doubt about that. Is it fair to say that General Proboa Subianto, the president's son-in-law, would have been one of those looking for a crackdown? It may not be fair, 
but uh, that's the perception of the public. So uh, I, I'm not pointing in any direction, but uh, acknowledging only that uh, General Viranto was able to somehow control and manage the situation uh, very well. It remains unclear exactly how the split in the armed forces played itself out. But in the event, the moderates, led by General Viranto, put a final argument to persuade the president it was time to go. The summary would be, Father, uh, you've done all you can do for this country. Uh, it is time to step down. We will guarantee the safety and honor of your family. At half past midnight, while the students sleep another night in the parliament building, President Suharto's oldest daughter, Tutut, phones Abdurrahman Wahid. She tells him her father has decided to resign. She said at the time that he will step down uh, the next morning, that is this morning, and that the reason is because the, there is enough big number of the members of parliament will try to desert him. Just after nine the following morning, President Suharto is history. Well, this is the living of a man of big ideas, man of big uh, thinking. But now he has to go out. I think history will judge uh, Suharto as a very unfortunate leader. He had been given chance by his people to develop his country, and then uh, he has a very, uh, you know, bad end, you know. And then he will be remembered by uh, history as a nepotistic uh, leader, as a corrupt leader. For all his faults, for all the problems that he had with his family, the business associates, uh, and the difficulties he had in handling the various psychophants in and outside governments throughout the past 25 years. On balance, he is a great man. I admire his tactical genius. I admire his uh, grace under pressure. And I admire his ability to think clearly in times of stress. And I regret very much that a lot of these abilities has been lost during the past uh, five years perhaps because he's been there too long. Will you have any memories of Suharto about qualities of his that you admire? <laughs> well, you come again six months from now and I'll tell you what <laughs> I admire about him, not now. It's more uh, correct to look this not as an end of era, but a beginning of a new, of a different era. Uh, a beginning of a different era where uh, uh, people feel confident in coming out criticizing and uh, people feeling confident in stating their views openly. We don't want the military leader again because uh, we want a democratization process happen in this country. history judge, Suharto? Uh, 
history as written by whom?